Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture, a magazine of American beekeeping. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flott, I'm editor of Bee Culture magazine. This is going to be a good, good podcast, Kim. Uh, you've known Tom for quite a while, haven't you? Yeah, we go back quite a ways. We were both at the University of Wisconsin almost at the same time, but that still goes back a long ways. Uh, and and uh, he's been with he's been associated with the magazine off and on over the years, and I've visited him a number of times. So uh, we're pretty close. That's fantastic. I know he has a lot of great details and 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 is willing to share them here with our listeners. So let's uh, call him up on Zoom right away. Well, we're here with uh, Tom Theobald from Niwot, Colorado, just down the street from where I used to live in Bertha. Tom, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Well, thank you, Jeff. I'm looking forward to talking about this, these subjects. The, so the, I'm looking forward to this discussion because I was away from beekeeping for, my, for a couple of years uh, when I moved away from Colorado back up, uh, up to the Pacific Northwest, and the neonics all exploded in that time frame. So what you have to say today is uh, I really look forward to hearing uh, and, and, and learning from you. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Hi, Kim, I'm doing pretty good. You're that's, looking good. That's good. Yeah, I like the white beard. Um, I do, too. You know, I'm much, <laughs> I'm much happier with mine now that it's white. Yes, yes, consistent. You know, I don't know how far we go back. I know we were both at uh, Wisconsin for uh, almost the same time, but that takes us both back a long way. I preceded you by about five years, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, but and 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 since I've been here, you have uh, a couple of times talked about your two queen system that you used to do, and I have been badgering you. Bad pun, I'm sorry. I have been badgering you for years to write something for our readers about that. We're not going to talk about it today, but are, will you come back and tell us about your two queen system? Uh, I certainly will, because it's been an interesting part of my beekeeping life, and I would be happy to do that. Yeah, it gets a little bit about what we're ta- and a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. But yes, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, that'd that's good. good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you to that promise, Tom. Okay. Um, and then maybe if I twist your arm enough, I can get you to write about it too. Well, it's easier to get me to talk than it is to get me to write. But you know, one step at a time. Okay. Well, that's you know, right. Tom. Tom, that's funny because that's what uh, Kim was trying to get me to write for him. And then when I visited with him in April, I said, "Well, how about a podcast instead?" So here we are. So it is. Easier yeah, to talk I to. I like this uh, form of communication. Frankly, it works out well. Yeah. Well, today we're not going to talk about your two queen system, Tom. We're going to talk about your involvement in the organic view and the neonicotinoid view and, and the role that you've been playing in that system and, and some of the things that you've come to, uh, that you've discovered. And I'm just going to kind of, we're just going to kind of stay out of your way and let you tell this story. I may interject with a question or two. And if, uh, if you've got a question, certainly don't, don't hesitate to ask one of us, but, uh, uh, t- tell me this story, Tom. Well, this is interesting. I've told this story many, many times, parts of it, the whole thing, here and there. So it's not like this is the first time. But what I would like to do today is I'd like to talk to the, your listeners a little bit about what my saga has been with a family of pesticides that was introduced in about 1994 called the neonicotinoids. First, a little of my own background. This is my 43rd year of beekeeping. I started out after I left the University of Wisconsin, I started out and spent the first 10 years of my working life in the corporate world and realized at the end of that 10 years that I, I, I was learning a lot. They were paying me well. I had a lot of friends, but I just did not want to be inside for the rest of my life. And I knew that if I didn't make the break, I was going to be stuck forever. Well, I did and didn't know what I was going to do. And within a couple of months, beekeeping emerged. I, uh, I had some wasps in a birdhouse. And it made me think of the bees. And I had a little time. I was going to sort of decompress until the money ran out. (laughs) And I thought, 
we were, we had a large garden, and I thought it would be interesting to to try some beekeeping. And I knew a little bit, but not too much. And the next door neighbor was a retired upholsterer from Boulder. And I talked to him about it, and he said, you know, I know, I used to know a beekeeper in Boulder. I said, well, see, uh, see if he's still alive and if he would be interested in talking to me. And Herman came back a couple weeks later, and he says, yeah, he's still alive. He'd be happy to talk to you. So I went in one August afternoon, and I spent a couple of hours talking with uh, Ted Johnson and his wife. Ted was 90 years old at the time, and he'd been a beekeeper in Boulder County since 1921. And what I came away with was this, this understanding, this appreciation that this couple had done something with their lives that they had just loved. So I got the name of the fellow that had what was left of his operation. I offered my body up to science and asked him if he would uh, let me work with him to get a little experience. And I just envisioned, like a lot of my friends, of only having a couple of colonies of bees. (laughs) Well, I worked through the harvest, and I realized that at one time people had actually made a living doing that. And Boulder County had a rich beekeeping history, and I was just crazy enough to think that maybe I would like to try to recreate that historical occupation of what I call community beekeeper. So Harlan called me one afternoon or one evening in October, and uh, he said, Tom, how would you like to buy half of my bees? That was 40 colonies. And I sat down with Barbara, and... (laughs) You have to say, you have to hand it to Barbara. She had all kinds of courage and she'd go wherever I led. And I said, I'm going to take the last of the settlement money and I'm going to buy bees. What do you think? Well, most women would set their hair on fire and be down the road. But she said, yeah, we could do that. She was raised on a dairy farm and she... uh, she just said, sure, wherever you lead, I'll follow. So that was the beginning. And I, I initially started building up. My first year, I got 25 packages of bees. I bought 40 colonies of bees the previous fall from Harlan. And within a short period of time, I was up to 200 colonies. And uh, that's, that's where the double queening entered in. And we can talk to, in more detail about that in, at the next opportunity but (coughs) excuse me um we always had pesticide problems and anyone who's been a beekeeper certainly anyone as long as i have can look back 30 or 40 years ago and they can look at the pesticide problems and the aerial spraying and all of those things and and we had those problems here too and what we did is we created one of the first spray alert programs in the country where the we had four beekeepers who had a map of all the bee yards in the county and the aerial applicator would call one of those representatives the night before and let us know where if they were going to spray within a mile of a bee yard and we in turn would advise the beekeepers and they would close their bees in usually or cover them or whatever they they had to do well we had some horrible bee kills despite that kind of cooperation. And it's a, it's a chemical that you're probably familiar with, Kim. It's a carbofurin, furidan, on alfalfa in the spring. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But the bees were able to, the bees in, in many cases would lose the entire field force. We might have a blanket of dead bees in an arc out in front of a colony that was an inch or two deep. And a huge bee kill. Well, the bees could recover from that in many instances and make a crop because we had two things at that time that we don't have today. We had an essentially healthy population of bees. A colony of bees has enormous regenerative potential if conditions are right. So we had an essentially healthy population of bees and an essentially healthy environment. Well, in 1994, a new family of chemicals was introduced called neonicotinoids, chlorinated nicotine compounds. 
Today, we have neither of those. We don't have a healthy population of bees. We don't have a healthy environment. And my connection with the neonicotinoids began probably the fall of 2004, 2005, right about the time that David Hackenberg was discovering what came to be called uh, colony collapse. I hadn't, the mice first showed up in Boulder County in 1995. At the time, I was the county bee inspector, the, the last county bee inspector in the state of Colorado and would be for another five years. So it was important for me to keep track of these things, not just because I was a beekeeper, but because I had a, a little broader role. The, 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 the varroa mites showed up in Boulder County in 1995. And for the next several years, we fought the battle of the varroa mite, slowly learning how to manage there were uh, remedies like apistan that came on the market. We began to learn a little bit about how to manage the mites and the mite losses, but the losses continued. And not only did they continue, but they escalated, which was a puzzle at the time. Looking back, I think I know what was going on. The mites appeared in Boulder County in 1990. The first of the neonicotinoids, imidacloprid, probably appeared at about that same time because it was released in the U.S. in 1994, I think. I think what was happening was we were beginning to get the mites under control with our management, but what we were beginning to see was the increasing use of imidacloprid and the damage that it causes the colonies. So about the fall of 2004, 2005, I hadn't been seeing many mites. My treatments were pretty expensive, and my numbers were down somewhat because I'd been losing colonies to the mites and, and I think, looking back, to imidacloprid. And I decided that I was going, after the harvest, I was going to examine each colony, and I was only going to treat those ones where I discovered mites. Nobody was doing that at, this, at that time. Everybody is looking for mites now. But it wouldn't have been typical for a beekeeper to go into his colonies in the fall in any great detail. We've worked with them all summer. We know what their situation is. We know what, what the problem colonies are. We pull the honey, we harvest the honey, and we button them up for the winter, and that's pretty much it. We might look at one or two of them, but not too much. But I went to the first bee yard after the harvest, and I started going through the colonies carefully to see if I could find any mites and make the decision whether I wanted to treat that colony or not. And what I discovered in the first colony was there was no brood. Good population of bees, but no brood. Went to the second colony, no brood. I did that for probably 10 colonies. It was kind of a windy day, so I had to button things up before I had gone through all of them. But in a few cases, there was a little bit of sealed brood left on the, what had been the outer edges of the brood nest, the last of the brood. What apparently had happened, for reasons unknown, was that either the queen had stopped laying or had stopped laying viable brood or some combination of the two right about the third week of September. It's a three-week uh, turnaround for brood, so all you have to do is take a look at what you've got, add a little bit of sealed brood left, count back about three weeks, and that gives you the point at which this problem began. So the question was, what's going on here? I came back about three days later when the wind wasn't blowing, and I started going through these colonies in greater detail, and what I found was they all had a queen, a seemingly healthy, active, robust queen, but no brood. So what's the reason? We'd begun to hear a little bit about the neonicotinoids, and we'd begun to learn that 
that corn was corn seed was being treated with neonicotinoids, and that was becoming an issue. And my hypothesis at that point, and I think still valid, was that what we were seeing was the effect of corn pollen contaminated with the neonicotinoids. And here's how I thought it was working. Corn is a fairly low-grade pollen, but it's uh, produced in abundance. Corn is wind-pollinated, and in order to affect that, it has to produce tons and tons of pollen. And in this part of the country, at least, the bees will exploit that pollen source, and they'll bring in corn pollen by the bucket load, store much of it, and typical of a healthy colony of bees, as soon as that pollen source begins to wane, they'll shift to whatever the fresh pollen of the day is. If a, if a colony of bees has a choice, they'll take fresh pollen over stored pollen. So a colony has all this corn pollen stored, and it stays there in the pantry until about the third week in September, where in this part of the country, we begin to see the floral spectrum begin to shrink. Well, not enough pollen coming in to, to meet the needs of the brood. The colonies are still producing a lot of brood, still strong. So they go to the pantry and they begin to feed that corn pollen. And it has the exact effect that we would have expected based on the science of years before done in France, and that is that the neonicotinoids affect the fertility of the queen and the viability of the brood. Hmm. So that's what got me started on the issue of uh, the neonicotinoids. I started doing some digging. I started doing some research. I found a really interesting story Re uh, revolving around the EPA and their approval of clothianidin in, in 2003. They had uh, rushed it to the market over the objection of the EPA scientists on the condition of a completion of a life cycle study. Tom, let me interrupt here for a second. Clothianidin is a neonicotinoid? The first one was imidacloprid. The second one was clothianidin. Okay, okay. The next Thanks. major one that we usually have to deal with is thiamethoxam. So clothianidin came in 2003. EPA scientists, based on what had ha happened in France just a few years before, wanted to have a life cycle study done before it was approved and released to the market. Well, that lasted for about a month, and they were handed their heads on a platter, and they were forced to agree to a conditional registration, the condition being what's customarily called the Cutler-Dupree study. The Cutler-Dupree study was to be, have been completed within a year. Turned out that it wasn't completed for several years. Uh, it was supposed to have been done in the United States on corn, ultimately was done on canola in Canada. And the, the con scientific construction of the, of the test was, well, my 12-year-old granddaughter said, Grandpa, that's bogus. <laughs> they put uh, two colonies of bees on five hectares, uh, and... They were free, and they planted the, the hectares to treated the seed. I may have some of the figures a little bit off. You'll understand what I'm saying. Five-acre piece planted to, to canola that the seed has been treated on. And yet these bees were free to fly out wherever they wanted to go and did, so that this canola represented a very small part of their forage. To make it worse... Right down the field were the control colonies, and the control colonies and the test colonies overlap. Mm -hmm. Poor science, but their conclusion was, hey, no problem. It was ridiculous. It was just absolutely ridiculous. And this was the criteria, the, the criteria that was going to determine whether canola, uh, clothianidin was uh, registered or not. Failed the 
test completely, f failed the condition completely. Well, I, I uncovered that fact and I released a uh, number of memos that I had uncovered. And in fact, um, that led to an article that I wrote for Bee Culture magazine in July of uh, 2010, still available um, and still pertinent. A little bit dated now, but I think it puts things in context. And I, was, I would encourage your listeners to go to the Boulder County Beekeepers website, Boulder County Beekeepers Association. In the toolbar at the top is an option, Tom's Corner. Click on Tom's Corner, and the first thing that will come up will be a reference to the article that I wrote for your magazine, Kim, titled, Do We Have a Pesticide Blowout? This was right at the time that we were having all the troubles in the Gulf with the oil spill. So I outlined in that what's some of the details of what I'm talking about here. And uh, that was in July of 2010. Well, just before Thanksgiving of, July of 2010, the phone rings, and it's a, a person in the EPA who had been sort of a, a, a whistleblower, a silent informant who had kept me apprised of what was going on. And they said, Tom, you should be the first to know. Bayer has come back to the EPA and asked for approval for seed treatment with clothianidin on cotton and mustard. I believe those were the two. And the EPA scientists have gone back and looked at the Cutler Dupree study and have determined that it's invalid. That was in part at least a consequence of the article that I wrote for your magazine, Kim. I'm sure of that. Tom, sorry to interrupt you. Kim, no, I that's think, fine. Yeah, that's uh, Kim, we think we need to take care of some uh, quick business here for you. So, hey, Jeff, let me remind you about our My Story event coming up in October again. Mm -hmm. We've got we've got Ray Oliveras and John Miller coming in on Saturday and Mike Palmer and Brett Aidy coming in on Sunday. They each they each get a half a day to tell their story, how they got started, where they're what they're doing now, and where they're going. And th this is an event that has never been before. I'm really right. excited about being able to host this. It's only fifty dollars a person. You can find information on our webpage in our magazine on how to register, hotel reservations, all of that. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be something you don't want to miss. We are filling fast. Our room is only so big, and already we're more than half full. So uh, if you're interested in coming to see Ray Oliveras, John Miller, Mike Palmer, and Brett Aidy, you better hurry up. That'd be really good, and that's on www.bculture.com, correct? Yes, it is. It's October 19th to the 21st. October 19th to the 21st. That'd be you good. It. Mark it on the calendar. Okay. Tom, back to... Back to uh, Bear. <laughs> and the yes. article and, and bee culture. So uh, it created quite a stir in the EPA when the EPA scientists took the opportunity to take a look at the Cutler Dupree study and, and say what they really thought of it. Well, they were handed their heads on a plate within a short period of time, and what happened was a conditional registration and uh, my article. Um, so the next year, I think it was probably January of 2011, I received a call from June Stoyer, who's the publisher and producer of an internet radio program called The Organic View. And she wanted to interview me about the neonicotinoid problem. We did an interview. We probably did uh, two or three interviews over the next several months. And that developed into uh, what she refers to as the co-sponsorship. I'm one of the co-common sponsors of it. And we've done an almost weekly program called the Neonicotinoid View. And we're one of, one of the few venues that is talking about this problem. We've interviewed most of the major players. At times, I've had commentary. She's had commentary. 
Part of the problem is that much of the major media is controlled by the corporations, and what people are hearing is not w what they should be hearing. And I'll expand on that a little bit in just a minute. Um, we were told initially that these products were going to be very safe, that they attacked synapses of which insects have a lot and mammals have relatively few. And we were told that, oh, for the bees, it's probably going to be 40,000 parts per billion before you're even going to notice an effect. Well, then, with a little experience, that was lowered to 8,000, and then 4,000. And about 1998, it was introduced in France, imidacloprid, it was introduced on sunflowers, Within that first year, they lost about a million colonies of bees. It was clear to the French beekeepers what was going on, and they revolted. And as a consequence, they uh, banned imidacloprid on sunflowers and declined to even register clothianidin. And much of the basic science about the effect of neonicotinoids on the bees was done at that time. So we knew a great deal before the EPA scientists made the decision that the Cutler-Dupree study was invalid. The EPA's response to that was they quietly registered uh, clothianidin, didn't announce it to the public, and just slipped it in under the under the door. But it's a, what's important is what people aren't being told, and that's the importance of the neonicotinoid view. June has made tremendous sacrifices to keep this going, and I certainly would encourage any listeners who feel inclined to support her efforts because she's gone to great lengths to keep this on the air. In any event, it's what we're not being told that's important and what, what I would like to get to today, and, and this is a fairly long preface, but the neonicotinoids are presented as being safe or safer, but it's what we aren't being told that's critically important. The EPA would tell you, and if you went to the statistics, what you would see was that we're using four million pounds of these neonicotinoids a year. We use the comparison of DDT, and almost everybody is familiar with DDT. DDT was outlawed by the EPA in 1972. The year of highest usage for DDT was 1959, 80 million pounds. Well, if you look at four million pounds of uh, neonicotinoids against 80 million pounds of DDT, that looks pretty, pretty good. <laughs> well, what you aren't being told is that that 4 million pounds represents only about 10% of what's actually used because the other 90% is used as a seed treatment. Now, the EPA has excluded that from oversight and regulation under what's uh, called the treated articles portion of the federal law. And basically what that says, if, if you're a rancher or a farmer and you're going to treat a fence post with an insecticide to keep the bugs from eating it, <clears throat> that's not a pesticide use. That's a treated article. Hmm. I'm not sure how they, they justify that distinction, but in any event, 90% of the neonicotinoid use is as a seed treatment, and that doesn't even appear on the radar. But it gets even worse because of that 90% that's used as a seed treatment, only about 5% actually goes into the plant. The, the balance goes into the soil and the groundwater, these are products that are water-soluble, have half-lives of years, and for which we have found there is no safe dose because their effect is cumulative and irreversible. Once they've affected a synapse, that's irreversible or essentially irreversible. 
So we have what I've characterized, and I don't believe I'm exaggerating at all. For the lower level life forms, we have the most massive poisoning of the environment in the history of humanity. This is enormous. And where have you heard that? You probably haven't heard that until right now. So what does that, what does that poisoning represent? Again, if we use DDT as the reference point, one of the things that has been found is that the neonicotinoids are five to 10,000 times more toxic to bees than DDT. If we use the DDT as the reference point of one, the neonicotinoids are one of the most toxic substances that we've ever seen. And certainly for the lower level life forms, the bees being one of those. Five to 10,000 times more toxic. So let's just do the math. And the first time I did this, I had to do it repeatedly because I was sure I had a decimal place off somewhere and was going to be an idiot. Five to 10,000 times more toxic than DDT. About 40 million pounds going into the environment every year. Lasts for years, so it's going into the environment on top of what's been put into the environment in previous years. What that represents is every year, the input into the environment of the toxic equivalent of somewhere between 200 and 400 billion pounds of DDT. Now, I've said that for the past several years, I've said that in every venue that I've had an opportunity to say it, I would invite a challenge from someone to show me where that math is wrong. This is a massive poisoning of the environment and it's being covered up. Hmm. So that's been the focus of my attention for several years now. And I think you know, the the corporate song is that it's all mites. It's mites and it's this great mystery that is going to take years and millions of dollars of research money to solve colony collapse disorder. They do everything they can to divert attention away from, from the neonicotinoids. And the neonicotinoids are a major player in this this drama. And until we begin to make some headway, Beekeepers are going to continue to lose their bees in enormous numbers. I, I just came upon research that's been done on the levels of uh, the neonicotinoids in the water. And the most stunning example is Iowa. Iowa has evaluated the level of imidacloprid in the drinking water. Hmm. And according to what the study says, Carbon filtration will remove about 90, I think 94% of the imidacloprid. And yet they're still finding imidacloprid in treated drinking water that's four to five times the threshold that's been set by the EPA for the point at which ecological damage begins. And that's 0.01 0.01 parts per billion of a middle corporate. So we have drinking water in Iowa that exceeds the EPA thresholds by about five times. You can only imagine what the level of the neonicotinoids are in the raw water in Iowa. And it's, a, it's apparent that wherever these chemicals have been used extensively, it's the same sort of thing all across the country. The USGS found that same uh, basic figure in the tributaries to the Great Lakes, four to five times the threshold. <clears throat> right here in Boulder, the city of Boulder, a year ago surveyed their water and found the same thing, four to five times. I've, I've spent years trying to unravel this mystery, and it, it kind of overwhelms the listeners. Um, <laughs> there are a number of places where they can go, and I would encourage them to do that. And I would encourage them to look at the science themselves so they don't just take for granted what I'm telling them, because the science is abundant. Um, in summary, basically what I've said is we're seeing a massive poisoning of the environment. 
billions of times the toxic equivalent to DDT, and the water is contaminated at four to five times the threshold that the EPA has set. Everything drinks. Yep. The bees are dying as a consequence of this, and unless we begin to make changes, it may already be too late. It may the environment may be so substantially poisoned already that it will take years, if not decades, to purge it of these chemicals. So, there are a couple of places they can go. They can go to uh, the Organic View, www.theorganicview.com. They could Google up the neonicotinoid view, which is sort of a subset of, of the organic view. A lot mm -hmm. of good information there, a lot of interviews. They can scroll back through the er earlier interviews, hear some of the major players speak. The other, I think, would be the Boulder County Beekeepers Association website. Just Google up Boulder County Beekeepers Association. Toolbar at the top, one of the options is Tom's Corner. Click on Tom's Corner and then read the article that I wrote for Kim's Magazine in July of 2010. As I said, a little dated, but it puts the, the, the question in context. And again, readers can scroll back through all of the things that we've posted there. I would encourage them to read the EPA memos to see what kind of... Uh, corruption is going on there and uh, I'm certainly open to questions and if they will direct their questions to you and you forward them to me I will do my best to answer all the questions. Well that would be great Tom and those questions would go to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com and I was going to add that for me as getting back into beekeeping a, a few years ago after moving up here what opened my eyes to the neonic problem was uh, was the movie um, we a documentary the vanishing of the bees and I've, I that was a eye opening uh, documentary so I would recommend uh, that as a introduction to the problem uh, I thought it was a that's very quite well a message film. you've had today Tom uh, I want to thank you I know we didn't have nearly enough time uh, but uh, you've laid out a lot of resources people can chase. And uh, a way to get a hold of you if you, they've got more information. I know you're you're just overflowing with information, and uh, more than happy to share. We're going to get you back here and talk about your two queen system just as soon as I can coax you back. And uh, uh, any, anything, any final words, Tom? Well, no. Just once again, I would encourage people to do their own research and not just rely on what I've told them. <clears throat> the the evidence is out there. The uh, European Union just decided to ban all outdoor uses of three neonicotinoids, imidacloprid, clothianidin, and thiamethoxam. And they did so after they had reviewed literally hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific studies that connect the dots between this family of pesticides and the losses that we're seeing. Yeah, okay, quite good the advice. Problem. Quite the problem. All right. All right. I got one more thing to add, Jeff. Certainly, go uh, ahead. Before we go, mm -hmm. and Tom, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna go a different direction here. Thank you. People know how to get a hold of you, and either through me or directly to you. So, I've got one more thing I want to add here, Jeff. We've got coming up um, later this month in in uh, July. Um, uh, 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 Kim and Jim webinar. Jim two and I are going to go out to his bee yard live. And take a look at his uh, the package the package bees that he put in this spring. We we're out there uh, when he put them in, and we're going to go check them. And if it rains, we're going to stand in the barn and look at them. Uh, <laughs> so uh, look for that. That's going to be um, July twenty fifth at noon Eastern Standard Time. Run about an hour, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be um, looking at Jim's bees and seeing. How good a beekeeper he is. So stay Always tuned. entertaining. Tune in for that one. That'd be good. Anything else, Jeff? No, that, that about wraps it up for today. Tom, we really appreciate you being here on the podcast and, and enlightening our listeners with about the neonic problem. Uh, and I do look forward to going back out to the uh, Boulder County Beekeepers Association website to get more background. So... And look forward to having you back to talk about Two Queen Systems. I hope you'll... Well, I'm, I'm ready to come back, and uh, I'm thankful the two of you have put together this venue for 
to give us an opportunity to discuss these questions. They're very important. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Tom. And, and Kim, uh, that wraps it up for today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff. Take right. care, Tom. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kim. Well, that was something. I, I It's been a while since I've heard and, and talked with Tom and and uh, long ago back in Longmont. And the whole neonics and neonicotine, is that right? Neonicotinoids. Neonic- re- re- what is it, Kim? Neonicotinoids. What is that? Neonicotin. Neonic. Now you got me doing it, Jeff. <laughs> neonicotinoids. I'll just say neonics. This whole neonics issue uh, is blowing up since I've in the last since I came back in, and and my first exposure was the Vanishing Bees with in that movie with uh, Dave Hackenberg, who I know through ABF. So uh, it's pretty amazing, uh, and and have Tom on the show to talk about it is. Well, it's pretty interesting and uh, enlightening. So what do you think about all this, Kim? Well, I think this whole thing was pretty intense, don't you, Jeff? You know, but Tom's been like that as long as I've known him, no matter the topic he's discussing. But I'm glad he could be here so he could review the history of his involvement with the neonicotinoids and honeybees. And I'm glad he brought to light, again, the pervasiveness of these chemicals in our environment. You know, If you're listening, he mentioned two areas where they were especially acute. The Midwest, certainly, with all of its corn and soybean acreage. And and from my perspective, the drainage of every creek, spring, river, and swamp into the Great Lakes where I live. I read that report when it came out not long ago, and I needed to be reminded of what it is that I could be drinking every day. But he also discussed the issues in years past with Cap M. You remember Pencap M, Jeff? Did you ever have any exposure to that? Well, when I was at the USDA bee lab, I did a lot of work with that. This pesticide is no longer available, and it was a standard treatment on corn back then, and the back then was 30 years ago, applied during bloom to protect the anthers from being destroyed by corn earworm, thus no pollen and no crop. I did quite a bit of work with that, uh, with Pencap M and sweet corn, uh, at the honey, uh, USDA Honeybee Research Lab. So I'm quite familiar with all of that history and the, the, the pain that it caused the beekeeping industry back then. These two very different chemicals, Pencap M was applied topically for protection and, and the neonicotinoids are, applied, are systemic, are still being used for the very same outcome, however, to increase corn yields for farmers. And Jeff, do you know what? Here's a number that will make you sit down if you're not already. 40% of that corn is used for ethanol. 40% of the poison going into our unit, into our environment is used to make gasoline. Can you believe that? Tom's quite convincing when it comes to the influence corporations have over the government agencies that are designed to protect its citizens, though, and he was pretty clear on that. This is especially well spelled out when he told the history of the lack of field tests of clothianidin before registration and then the quality of the tests that were finally done. Sadly, this has not changed, and I'm going to be honest, looking into the future, I don't see it getting any better with, with, thing, way the, with the way things are going right now. You know, if you want to start a fight at a beekeeper's meeting, Jeff, mention colony losses, pesticides, and varroa in the same sentence, and then duck. <laughs> These are extremely, there are extremely strong defenders of the causes of our current colony losses. One party is certain that it is simply plainly, squarely due to the poison in our environment. The other party is certain it's the varroa virus complex and plain old beekeeping laziness, being cheap or stupid for not controlling the mites that are the root cause of all of these losses. Tom makes a good case for the poison in our world being to blame, and I'm quite certain he's right. But here's my qualifier, Jeff, for some parts of the planet. I'm not dismissing colony losses and neonicotinoids by any stretch, Jeff, and you, Tom. But I'm quite certain that the varroa virus complex has a role in this mess, too. We simply can't dismiss this demon. And if the recent Kim and Jim talks with the Project APSM folks have any influence, Here's the problem that needs to be solved yesterday. If you recall, Jeff, Tom mentioned this article back in 2010 that he wrote for our magazine that kind of started this all. 
And what I did was I went back and I got that article and I've put it on our webpage on the August issue of Bee Culture. So if you go to our webpage, beeculture.com, way up into the top and click current issues, on ma- click on magazine and then go to current issues and find the August issue. You can scroll down and you can find that article that he was referring to. And it'll give you an eye full and an ear full of what was going on even back then. That's going back eight years and he's going back several years before that. Hmm. Um, I want to, before I go, Jeff, just a couple of things. One is uh, the Kim and Jim show, July 21st, noon, Eastern Standard Time. Jim and I are going to go out live to his bee yard. We're going to check those packages he put in last spring. Go to our webpage, go way up at the top, click on the Kim and Jim show, and you can get registered. It's free. And if you don't get to live one, they're all they're all archived there. So uh, we've got old articles on our webpage. We've got Kim and Jim coming up uh, later this month. We've got Dean Nicotino. It's still causing troubles. I think that's beekeeping today, Jeff. That's a lot, Kim. Never gets dull, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it'd be fun to go to a beekeeping meeting and mention bee losses, viruses, varroa, and uh, pesticides all at the same time and just stand back and watch it go. Uh, stand way back, Jeff. Way back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kim. Well, we'll talk to you next time. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Take care, Jeff. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>